To this point, we've talked a lot about all sorts of different properties of stars. We've talked luminosity, we've talked brightness, we've talked temperature, we've talked color, all sorts of stuff. However, one thing we have yet to say anything about is mass. Now, actually figuring out the mass of stars is surprisingly difficult. The reason is, we have to figure out its gravitational influence. So a single star by itself, without seeing how its gravity is pulling on other stuff, we're not going to be able to use that to actually figure out mass. Well, fortunately for us, about half of all stars in the sky are actually part of multiple star systems, with most of those being binaries. A binary are two stars that are orbiting around each other. Now, when we look up at the sky and we see two stars that appear close together, does that actually mean that they're close together in space? No, not necessarily. We have no sense of depth as we just look up at stars in the sky. So although they look close, and they're close to the same line of sight, they could still be thousands of light years apart. So just because they look close doesn't mean that they actually are close. These types of stars that appear close but are not actually close together, these are known as optical double stars, sometimes called optical binaries. Now sometimes we do have two stars that don't just appear close, they actually are close, and they're orbiting around each other. For example, we have this pair where you can easily see that there are two stars and they're slowly orbiting around each other. In this case, we can easily see both stars. When this happens, where you can see both stars and see that they're orbiting around each other, these are known as visual binaries, okay, because we actually see both stars. Well, as we watch these visual binaries orbiting, we can use Newton's form of Kepler's third law to determine the sum of the masses. Okay, so the mass of both stars altogether is going to be related to their semi-major axis cubed and their sidereal period squared. Okay, so A is the distance between the stars and P is how long it's going to take for them to orbit around each other. Now that is only the sum. That only tells us that both stars altogether equal this much mass, not each star's mass individually. To figure out each star's mass individually, we need more information. So what we can do is we can use the distance from the center of mass. So if you remember back when we were talking about gravity and how Newton used his laws and the law of gravity to explain Kepler's laws of planetary motion, he showed that planets and the sun actually orbit their center of mass. Planets don't orbit the sun. Instead, the planets and the sun orbit their center of mass. Hey, we used our... A <clears throat> We use the example of kids on a teeter-totter. Hey, if you've got two kids that are about equal in size, then their center of mass is right exactly in between. If you've got a first grader and a sixth grader, then the center of mass is going to be closer to the sixth grader. Hey, so the center of mass is the balance point between the two. So as we look at these stars, we can actually start to figure out which one's more massive and which one's less massive by looking at their distance from the center of mass. Whichever star is bigger will be closer to the center of mass, and whichever one is smaller will be farther from that center of mass. So as we watch these two stars and see how they're orbiting around the center of mass, we can determine the ratio of the two masses. So we have the sum and we have the ratio. That's enough information to then figure out each star individually. Now don't panic, I'm not going to make you do it, eh? but it does give us enough information to figure out the mass of each star. Well as we start to look at the massive stars along the main sequence, we actually find a very interesting trend. Now notice, I want to stress, this is only on the main sequence. But along the main sequence, this diagonal line, the stars in the bottom right are low mass. And as we move up and left along the main sequence, the stars get higher and higher mass until the stars in the top left have the highest mass. Now also notice that as we go along that sequence, we're changing to hotter and hotter temperature. We're also getting to higher and higher luminosity. All stars on the main sequence have essentially the same chemical composition, what we talked about previously, of 74% hydrogen, 25-ish percent helium, and 1-ish percent metals. 
Now, all stars on the main sequence are also in the process of hydrogen fusion, like we talked about with the sun. So, in their core, they're converting hydrogen into helium, and in that process, they release energy. The primary difference among all stars on the main sequence appears to be their mass. Mass is the fundamental property for all main sequence stars. Now, the more massive a star is, the greater the pull of gravity is crushing down in on it. Okay, what that means is down at the core, we're going to have a higher temperature and a higher pressure. If we have higher pressure and temperature, this means we're going to have a faster fusion rate, meaning that it's going to fuse hydrogen to helium faster. Because of that, it's going to generate more energy, and because it has more energy, it's going to be hotter and more luminous. On the flip side, when we look at low mass stars, if they are low mass, then they have less gravity pulling in, which means down in the core we have less pressure and less temperature, which leads to a slower fusion rate. If we have a slower fusion rate, it's going to produce less energy, and if it creates less energy, it's going to be less luminous and have a lower temperature. All of these things always trace back to mass. In fact, once a star's mass is locked in, we actually can even predict how long its life is going to last. We'll get to that in just a bit. We can also predict how it's going to die and what it turns into when it dies. Almost everything is locked into the mass of a star. Now, something that is interesting about all of this is that the mass of a star, again, is going to relate to how long it's going to last. So on this table, we're looking at different masses of stars, their temperature, spectral type, luminosity, and their main sequence lifetime. So how long it is that they're going to stay on the main sequence before leaving it. Starting up here at a 25 solar mass star, so this has a surface temperature of 35,000 Kelvin and a spectral type O. So what color is this star going to be? I hope you're thinking blue. O stars are always blue. This will have a main sequence life of 4 million, with an M, 4 million years. Okay, so 25 solar mass has 4 million year lifespan. When we talked about the sun, it's one solar mass. It's a G-type star, so it is yellowish. And it has a main sequence lifetime of around 10 to 12 billion years. Billion with a B. Then if we go down here to even lower mass, here we've got a half of a solar mass. This is a type M. So what color is it going to be? I hope you're thinking red. Hey, this will have a main sequence lifetime of 700 billion years. And then if we go even smaller mass, down to something like one quarter solar mass, those stars will have a main sequence lifespan of over a trillion years. Okay, so notice that the mass of the star is directly related to its lifespan. Now, notice that the higher the mass, the shorter the life. The 25 solar mass star had a life, uh, main sequence lifespan of only 4 million years. Yes, I just said only 4 million, but remember, we're comparing this to billions and trillions, so I, I can get away with it. Anyway, so because of this, because we have a high mass star, this means that it's going to have a very, very fast fusion rate. Okay? And because it has a fast fusion rate, it actually burns through all of that material very, very quickly, which leads to its relatively short lifespan. On the other side, when we look at very low mass stars, like that half solar mass star, because it has less gravity, it has less mass allowing everything to be crushed in, it has a much slower fusion rate. And because its fusion rate is so slow, it very, very slowly goes through all of that hydrogen, allowing that hydrogen to last for a very, very long time. Uh, to me, this is actually something similar to cars. For example, I have a friend who has a half-ton truck, a, one of these big monster, it's not actually a monster truck, but really large truck. Now, if he drives that around every day going to work and back and running errands and whatever, even though it's a big truck with a big gas tank, he still has to fill it, fill it up maybe twice a week. 
His wife, on the other hand, has one of these compact, super fuel-efficient cars. And if she does the same thing, drives it around every day to work and back running errands and whatever, she's going to have to only fill it every couple of weeks. Even though it's a small car with a small gas tank, she still only has to fill it every couple of weeks. The difference here is how fast they're burning through the gas. A big, heavy truck has a very, very bad miles per gallon. And because it has bad miles per gallon, that means that it burns through all that fuel really, really fast. The super compact uh, fuel-efficient car, it doesn't carry much fuel with it, but it really lets that fuel last. It has really good miles per gallon. We have the exact same thing going on with stars. Our high-mass stars are like the big truck. They burn through all that fuel really, really fast. The low-mass stars are like the compact, fuel-efficient cars that really make that fuel last for a very long time. Now, with some of these low-mass stars lasting for trillions of years, that means that if some of these stars had formed right at the instant of the beginning of the universe, they would actually appear today exactly as they did at the very beginning. Our current estimate of the age of the universe is around 13.6 billion years old. So they could still be on the main sequence, which is absolutely amazing. Alright, here is our third lecture quiz question. Which type of star has the highest mass? A, O, B, B, C, F, or D, K? Go ahead and think about it and we'll discuss in just a bit. So which spectral type has the highest mass? It is A. O-type stars are going to have the highest mass. M-type have the lowest. So as we go through O, B, A, F, G, K, M, O's have the highest mass, M have the lowest mass on the main sequence. Now once we get off the main sequence, other stuff takes over. But this is true on the main sequence.